Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be a Bible study on Gog and Magog. And uh, this might be one of those things that gets uh, a strike or deleted. I don't know. But um, I, I'm going to have to fix my Telegram channel. I suspect I've got some um, JIDF people, if you know what that stands for. The Unahuish uh, Internet Defense Force, the Six Point, and uh, with the Star crowd. Yeah, i got to fix that channel. I... You know, I've got Gab going on. I got YouTube, uh, Telegram. I got like three email accounts, plus the research I do, plus the videos, plus family, whatever stuff. You know, keeping the house up, whatever. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a full time job. You know, plus I try to answer all the emails. You know, I've been thing is if i'm doing answering emails there's no bible studies and if i'm doing bible studies i get behind on the emails so i try to you know balance but all right so let's take a look at uh, gog and magog and i think what we ought to do is start off with uh well let's start off with japheth J-A-P-H-E-T-A-H. Now, Noah had three sons. He had Shem. Now, Shem was the uh, chosen seed line of the Lord. I mean, out of Shem came the Hebrews, Eber uh, and Israel and King David and Christ. And if you look at Christ's genealogy in Luke chapter 3 it goes all the way from Christ all the way back to Adam through Shem and anybody that tells you that God doesn't have a chosen seed line and that everybody can be saved um, they're not much of a scholar that's that's all I can tell you Ham is bad news. Ham's not kosher, right? Maybe that's why they named ham ham pork, right? I don't know, because it's not it's not kosher. So Noah had Shem, the chosen seed. Ham, Ham was bad news. Ham was the Canaanites, and Egypt was also called the land of Ham. And then the third son was Japheth. So you can read that in Genesis 6.10. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. In Genesis 9.27, we read the following. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he, Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem. So Japheth is going to be enlarged. And he's going to live with Shem. They're going to live together. Matter of fact, uh, Japheth, there's nothing really bad about Japheth's seed line. Matter of fact, uh, if, if I remember correctly, there was a verse in the Bible that uh, Israel could intermarry with Japheth and then they could be accepted after a period of time. I'm not, I'd have to look that up, but there was nothing wrong with Japheth. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Hmm. So let's see. Genesis 10 2. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, Gomer, and Magog. Magog. That's going to be the. Uh, what this study is going to be about. And 
Medei and Javan. Now, Javan, some Bible scholars say that Javan has reference to Greece. I don't know that for a fact, but supposedly Javan was an old name for Greece. I don't know. Might be true, might not be. Uh, and Javan and Tubal and Meshach and Tiras. So, so let's take a look. I guess we got to read just Genesis 10. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were, born, uh, were sons born after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, isn't it funny, they call, you know, Gomer Pyle, USMC, yeah, and Magog, and Medai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshach, and Tiras, and the sons of Gomer. Now remember, Gomer was a son of Japheth, the, and the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Ashkenaz, very important, keep that in mind. Matter of fact, there is a... Uh, major branch of the you know who's that call themselves by that name ashkenaz now remember japheth was not the chosen seed line so you know they keep saying oh you know the chosen ones but they're from the non-chosen seed line they at least that's what they take their name so they're admitting they come from japheth which is not shem the chosen Shem was the chosen, Ashken Japheth was not. And the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, and Riphath, and Togarmah. And then and the sons of Javan, Elisha, and Tarshish. Tarshish is supposedly an ancient name for Spain. Kittim and Dodanim. By these were the isles. The Isles, what is an I, what are the Isles? I-S-L-E-S. -E it's just a, another way of saying islands. By these were the Isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families in their nations. What was Greece? Greece was a, uh, an island nation. Matter of fact, Greece, uh, Turkey used to be called Greece until the uh, Ottoman Turks, Muslim Ottoman Turks, went in and decided to uh, peacefully, culturally enrich uh, that area. And uh, let's just say the Greeks were disposed of. I'm being kind of cautious with my words here. All right, so, and the sons of Ham, and the sons of Ham, Cush. Cush is generally considered Ethiopia area. In Mizraim, uh, I think that's Libya, and Put, and Canaan. Canaan was the Canaanites. And the sons of Cush, Sheba, Seba, and Havilah, and Sabta, and Ramah, and Sabtika, and the sons of Ramah, Sheba, and Dedan. And Cush began, begat, and Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth, in the earth. Um, if you look up all the legends of Nimrod, he was not a very good, well-talked-about character. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. A mighty hunter of what? Some say a mighty hunter, hunter of men's souls. I don't know how true that is. It's just a legend, but I thought I'd throw that out there. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, whereas, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. All right, we're talking about Ham here, right? Ham's descendants. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. You know, the Tower of Babel, Babel, God confused the languages. They didn't like them building the stairway to heaven or, well, the 
you know, yeah. So Nimrod is associated with not good things. Uh, and Eric and Akkad and Kalne in the land of Shinar. What is the land of Shinar? Well, Babel, Babylon, Babylon. You know, God didn't say many good things about Babylon. Out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh. What was Nineveh? Nineveh was the capital city. Uh, if you've ever read, bothered to read the book of Jonah, guess where he was sent? Nineveh. Yeah, Nineveh. And uh, that was their capital city, the Assyrian Empire which carried northern Israel away captive. Boy, I, I could do all these things that I'm mentioning. I, I mean, I could do multiple hour studies on just what I just read right here, going into the, you know, about Ash, uh, Assyria and Nineveh and what have you. So, all right. And builded Nineveh and the city Rehoboth and Kela. And recent between Nineveh and Kela, the same as a great city. And Mizraim begat Ludum and Ananim and Lehabim and Naph to him. I don't know. Something like that. And Parthrusium and Kashluhim. Out of him, out of whom came Philistum. Now, what is this Philistum? Uh... This was the progenitor of the Philistines. You know, King David fought Goliath, who was a Philistine, the, one of the giants. And Kaphtorim and Canaan, Canaan, you know, the Canaanites, beget Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth. Sidon isn't talked very nicely about in Scripture, and uh, Heth is definitely not spoken of either. And the Jebusite and the Amorite and the Gergesite and the Hivite and the Archite and the Sinite. What? A, 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 a Sinite? S-I-N? Sin? I don't... I, boy, I, boy, I tell you what, I sure wouldn't want to be of the tribe of the Sinites. What kind of yeah, Sinite? Verse 18, And the Arvadite, and the Zemurite, and the Hamathite, and afterward were the families of the Canaanites. The Canaanites spread abroad. And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as thou comest to Gerar, unto Gaza, as thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah, where have I read that about before? Uh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that was the, uh, in celebration of LBGT Day, when the Lord, uh, gave them a very warm reception, yeah. As thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah, and Adma and Zeboim, uh, even unto Lasha. These are the sons of Ham, after their families, after their tongues, in their countries, and in their nations. All right. So we covered Japheth, we covered Ham, let's cover the children of Shem, verse 22. And the children of Shem, Elam and Asher and Arphaxad and Lud and Aram, and the children of Aram, Uz and Hul and Gither and Mash, and Arphaxad begat Selah and Salah begat Eber. Now Eber was the progenitor of the Hebrews. Wow, I haven't even started this study. I'm just doing the intro, and it's 15 minutes already, almost. Eber was the, the progenitor of the Hebrews. Keep that in mind. And unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided. Have you ever heard of continental drift? Some people say that uh, there was a super single continent called, uh, they call it Pangaea or whatever. Uh, and then some think that uh, 
the earth was divided sometime probably around the time of the flood and then all the continents split up and if you could believe anything the government and science community tells you supposedly the continents are moving a couple feet a year i i don't know you know eh. when they tell me something i always take it with a a, a salt shaker more than a grain of salt i'll tell you that the name of the one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided. And his brother's name was Joktan. Uh, let's see. Okay. We could keep reading this, but, you know. Uh, let's skip down to verse 31. These are the sons of Shem, after their families, after their tongues, in their lands, after their nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah, after their generations, in their nations. And by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. So, what did we learn here? We learned that of the sons of Shem, or I'm sorry, Japheth. Japheth had Gomer, and Gomer had a son named Ashkenaz. A-S-H-K-E-N-A-Z. Very interesting. So, who are these people? Well, we're going to get to that. I think. Let me see here. What should I do? All right, let's take a look at Gog, G-O-G, and Magog, M-A-G-O-G, every time it appears in the Bible. According to the King James Bible Online, Magog appears five times in the Bible, and Gog appears nine times. And we just discovered, because of Genesis 10, that... Gog, or is it Magog? I forget which. Well, son of Gomer, of Japheth, the non-chosen seed line. So let's take a look at what this entails. Now, a lot of people that claim to be Bible scholars, which I don't claim to be a Bible scholar by no means, but they claim that in the end times, that Gog and Magog will invade the uh, invade Israel, and the poor you know who's will be uh, under attack. And then there are those that'll tell you that the Ashkenaz is Germany, and they'll tell you that Germany is of Japheth, non-Israel. Hmm, makes you wonder. What you should do is look at all the prophecies that God made of Israel and then ask yourself, are the people that claim to be Israel, do they fulfill those prophecies? And if the answer is no, they don't fulfill the prophecies that God made to these, to his people, you got to ask yourself this question. Did God lie? Or is your interpretation wrong? Now, there's two things uh, when you're talking about prophecy. Uh, God makes covenants or promises. There's two different kinds. There's the unconditional promise, okay, when God told Abraham that he would make his seed, his children, as the stars in the sky and the sand on the sea. That was an unconditional promise. Abraham, don't matter what you do, I'm going to do this for you. Your children are going to be all over the place. Multiplied millions of them. Unless you don't think that there's multiplied millions of grains of sand on the ocean or on the seashore. I'm from Florida. I will guarantee you there are millions of grains of sand in Florida alone. Okay? Unconditional promise. 
Then Abraham said, uh, or God, well, forget Abraham. God said that if, conditional promise, if you did this, I would do that. You know, if you obey my voice and, and honor me and keep my commandments, uh, that I would bless you. You would have rain, you would have crops. Um, but uh, we're on the, not the blessing part, now we're on the curse part. But the thing is, when you look at all the promises that God made to Israel, there's a certain, certain group over in the Middle East that don't fulfill those promises. They don't. So either they were conditional promises that they don't fulfill, or we've been sold a bill of goods that's a lie. Now, we got to take a look at that. It's very important. God made a lot of promises to Israel. There were 12 tribes, and each tribe had different promises. For example, Judah was to be the tribe of the kings. And he was to be first in war. Where does all the royalty in Europe come from? Uh, over the last few hundred years? Would you believe Germany? During World War I, the royalty of England, Germany, and Russia were all cousins. They were all Germans. Did you know that King George, for those of you that don't know it, uh, King George was the ruler in England during the American War for Independence, in 17, what was 1775, 76. Um, he was German. Yeah. I forget if it was King George I or King George II. One of them didn't even speak English. He spoke German. The King of England didn't even know his own, uh, the language of the country he was ruling, from what I have heard. How does that work out? Who was the... Who was uh, the, the tribe of the kings? Hmm. Uh, during the Mexican War for Independence, I think it was Maximilian, during the time of, I think, Napoleon or whatever, uh, from what I understand, Maximilian, who was the ruler of Mexico, I, I think he was German. Yeah. <laughs> you, you got a German king of Mexico. They eventually got rid of him, but, you know, how's that work? You know, in Germany, two world wars, it took the entire world to take down Germany. It took the Germans in America to, to take down the Germans in Germany. Do you know that about 100 years ago, uh, according to some history books that I'd read, that... 25% of the United States' population was of German extraction. Yeah. You want to buy the best equipment in the world, you go to Germany. I mean, technical equipment. Uh, you know, and they want you to think that they are, uh, they're Japheth? Uh, really? I, I don't know. I'm going to have to take a look at that. But, hey, what do I know? All right, let's take a look at Gog and Magog. We're going to have to go to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 38. All right, Ezekiel chapter 38, King James Bible, verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog 
the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And before we go any further, I want you to remember something. Uh, what country invented the printing press? Uh, Gutenberg in Germany. What was the first Bible they printed? I mean, the first book they printed? Yeah, okay, it was the Bible. I said the punchline before I told the joke, right? Well, it's printing the Bible's not a joke, but yeah. First thing on, off of Gutenberg's press was the Bible. Germany was, in times past, a very Christian country. Martin Luther, the Reformation. I mean, you know, come on. And they want us to think that Germany is a non-covenant people? Really? Hmm. What is probably one of the best cars in the world that you could possibly own? Uh, let's see. Audi? BMW? Mercedes? Porsche? Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, Germany was in ruins after World War II. And look at them now. They have one of the, I think they have one of the three strongest economies in the world. It's uh, Germany, the United States, and China. And the only reason China's there is because we took all our industry from the United States and shipped it to China. Thank you, uh, international you-know-whos. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the only reason. You know, when uh, Henry the Kissin juror under President Nixon sent envoys to Red China to open it up, China was a backward third world Nothing. Today, they have, I think, a second, arguably the largest economy in the world because we shipped all our industry over there, all our manufacturing. And from what I understand, they have more submarines than the United States. And of course, people say, oh, well, they're, you know, they're junk. I don't think so. Huh. Uh, they copied the uh, German Dolphin class submarines. I think Germany knows a couple things about subs. Uh, if you know anything about history at all, Germany's subs are top of the line. But uh, yeah, and our friends over in the Middle East uh, probably sold the technology to China, but yeah. So they have more submarines than the United States does. That's a significant thing, people. Big big. If there's ever a war, um, our Navy's in deep uh, doo-doo, I guess you could say. Yeah. All right. So, and the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. And I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws and will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia. Now, what is Persia's modern day name? Iran. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer, I remember Gomer was one of, uh, I think that was the father. Yeah, that was, or one of the father or one of the brothers of Japheth. Gomer and all his bands, the house of Tog Togarma of the north quarters and all his bands and many people with thee. Be thou prepared and prepare for thyself, self, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years, 
In the latter years, we're talking about the end times here. In the latter years, thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out from many of many people against the mountains of Israel. So we're talking about the land here, which have been always waste, but is brought forth out of the nations and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. Hmm. Thus saith the Lord God. So uh, evidently there's going to be a, an invasion. You know, they're going to come in like a storm. They're going to be like a cloud to cover the land. You know, all their bands, all the people with thee, with them. Verse 10, thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at the same time shall things come into my thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. Do you know one of the few countries that had villages with un unwalled villages? You know, in times past, all the cities and villages had walls and gates to keep out the enemy and, and dangerous animals and what have you. One of the only countries in the world that doesn't have this is the U.S. Think about it. Our cities don't have walls and gates, you know? Think about it. We've always been sort of kind of safe here uh, until recently, you know, the last 50, 70 years or so. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take a spoil and to take a prey to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited. You know, the U.S. was a desolate place, but today it's inhabited. I'm just pointing this out. I'm not saying that is the interpretation of this particular verse, but it is one possible explanation, and I've heard people say that, so take it with a grain of salt. And upon the people that are gathered out of the nations which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish and all the young lions thereof shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey? To carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, Thus saith the Lord God, is in that day when my people of Israel dwell, dwelleth safely, shalt thou not know it? And thou shalt come from thy, thy place out of the north parts. So these Japheth people are going to come out of the north parts. Uh, we're going to cover that more later. Remember that. They come out of the north parts. Thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. And thou shalt come against, uh, and thou, verse 16, and thou shalt come up against my people of Israel. Now remember, Israel's a people, not necessarily a land. And thou shalt come up against my people as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days. You know, the last days. And I will bring thee against my land that the heathen may know me, the heathen, when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Thus saith the Lord God, 
Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I will bring thee against them? Many years. The end times. And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come up against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury, that my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy, remember, God's a jealous God. He even says, my name is Jealous. God doesn't want us worshiping the devil, one of his created beings. You know, I mean, can you imagine if you were married to somebody and they they said they loved your brother or sister more than you, but, you know, well, yeah, I'm married to you, but I love your brother or sister that's who I really love. I, you know, wouldn't you, how would you feel? You know, God's a jealous God. And if you want to worship somebody and love somebody that tried to kill him, I, I don't think he's going to feel very happy about you. So, you know, but that's just my guess, right? Verse 19, for in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath, fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. A great shaking. What was that song, whole lot of shaking going on? Was that Jerry Lee Lewis? Something like that? I don't know. Listen to this. This, this ties right into Revelation. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth. Reminds me of Washington, D.C. And all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. And the mountains shall be thrown down. The mountains shall be thrown down. And the steep places shall fall. And every wall shall fall to the ground. Hmm, what does that sound like? Let's take a look. In Revelation 6 and verse 12, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. Well, when there's an earthquake, isn't there a lot of shaking? Yeah, sure is. And lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Hmm. Now, if you want, you can read Joel 2 on your own. J-O-E-L. Um about a great army, but we're just going to skip and go to verse 10. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their signing, shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. His camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn ye, turn ye, even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. And rend your heart, and not your garments. And turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth he of the evil." And who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Wow. All right. I might be getting ahead of myself here, but uh, let's go to Revelation 16, verse 10. 
And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. Well, what happens when the sun and the moon don't shine anymore? Yeah, I guess the kingdom would be full of darkness, right? And they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. Uh, you know, I, I've... There's a lot of famous Bible teachers that'll even say that repentance is not a part of a Christian's life. Just believe. Well, these people believe in God, but they didn't repent of their deeds, their wickedness. I mean, really? Really, dude? I just don't get it. Oh, if you repent, that's a work. You know, that's lordship salvation. You're trying to earn your salvation. No. Read James chapter 2. If somebody starts talking about lordship salvation, let them read James chapter 2 and argue with James. Don't argue with me. Argue with James. Yeah, he grew up with a guy named Jesus. He had a mother named Mary and a father named Joseph. He knew Jesus his whole life. And he was a bishop of a church. You know, argue with the book, argue with James chapter 2. You know, if, if you see somebody's freezing outside and they're a brother in the faith and they don't have a coat and you wouldn't even bother to give them a coat when you've got five of them that you haven't used in years and you wouldn't even take a coat out of your closet and give it to them and you're going to you're gonna claim that you have faith, uh, you might be cast into outer darkness in the lake of fire. But uh, read James chapter 2. Don't, don't argue with me. So these people blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they repented not of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. The unholy trinity, the dragon, the beast, the false prophet. Have you ever noticed that right-wing uh, symbol, the frog, keke, whatever they call it? The frog god was from Egypt. Why, why would they pick a frog to symbolize the right wing? I mean... You know, one of the plagues in Revelation, or I'm sorry, e one of the plagues of Egypt was all the frogs that came out of the Nile. It was a one of the Lord's challenges to one of the gods of Egypt, which was the frog god. I, I forget what it was called. But, uh, yeah, if you go to like Gab or something, you know, they, they got the little frog that's the right wing symbol. I don't think so. I mean, you may as well pick a goat to be your symbol, you know. Now, there's nothing good about frogs in the Bible. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, which is Satan, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth, and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. You know why they tell you that the place in the Hebrew tongue is called Armageddon? So that anybody that was a Hebrew could understand what they were talking about. Why is that? Because the New Testament was written in Greek. And if you didn't know, if you, if you were a Greek reading this, or if you were a Hebrew reading this in the Greek, you would say, oh, okay, Armageddon. Yeah, that's, that's a Hebrew word. I understand what that is. Okay. Because the New Testament was written in Greek, not Hebrew. Sorry, Hebrew Roots people, you're lying, you're wrong, 
You may not intentionally lie, but you're lying. You know, if you repeat a lie, that makes you a liar. Even though you don't know you're lying, you're still wrong. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. And here's the punchline. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. A whole lot of shaking going on. And the great city was divided into three parts. And I believe this is Jerusalem. And the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. Why did the islands fled away? They were shaken off their foundation and sank into the sea, evidently. That's, that's how I see it. If somebody's got a better idea uh, or better explanation, I'm be, please post it. And the mountains were not found. Why? Because they were shaken so hard they were flattened. You know what kind of an earthquake it would take to flatten the Himalayas, the Alps, the Rocky Mountains? I mean, really? The mountains were not found? And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, uh, talent is about 70 pounds or about 32 kilograms. You get hit in the head from a 32 kilogram, 70 pound stone from the sky. And I think you're going to need more than a bottle of aspirin. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Bingo. All right, let's go back to Ezekiel 38. Uh, yeah, Ezekiel 38, 19. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. And people will try to say that that great city that was divided into three parts that we just read, oh, that's Rome. That's Rome. I don't think so. I don't think so. Surely on that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. And the mountains shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall fall to the ground and I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains saith the Lord God every man's sword shall be against his brother and I will plead against him with pestilence disease and with blood death and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him an overflowing rain and great hailstones didn't we just read about hailstones in Revelation? Yes. Fire and brimstone. Wow. Doesn't this sound like end time stuff? Oh, yeah. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Lord ain't playing around here. He's going to he's going to make his name known. You know, when the antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast, whatever you want to call him comes with power from the dragon and the false prophet, the unholy trinity, going to have a hard time explaining all this. You know? Really. He'll probably blame it on the people. Oh, you guys aren't uh, giving me the honor I deserve. Therefore, I'm going to bring down fire and brimstone and I'm going to wipe everybody out. And people are not going to be understanding why. Wait a minute, we're, we're doing everything you tell us and all these plagues are coming upon us. 
it's going to be interesting. I don't know if I'll live to see it. I don't know if any of us will live to see it, but it'll be interesting. All right, let's go to uh, Ezekiel 39, next chapter. Therefore thou, son of man, prophesy against Gog, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. And I will turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee. Wow. Uh, you know, uh, sixth part. <laughs> you, you've got a group of people, but you're only going to have about, oh, I don't know, 16 or 17 percent of you. Uh, wow. And I will turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee and will cause thee to come up from the north parts and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. And I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand and cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand. Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands and the people that is with thee. I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. Thou shalt fall upon the open field, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. And I will send a fire on Magog, and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles. And they shall know that I am the Lord. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them pollute my holy name any more. You know, maybe that's why this holy, uh, I mean, the sacred name, uh, Hebrew root stuff, you know, why we don't, I don't think anybody knows how to actually pronounce the Lord's name. I, I, that's my opinion. You know, some say, well, you know, Jehovah, others say Yahweh, 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 I, I don't know. The Lord hasn't shown me, and I'm not sure anybody does, because maybe they don't, he doesn't want his holy name polluted. So, I don't know. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them pollute my holy name any more. And the heathen, and the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One, in Israel. Behold, it is come and it is done, saith the Lord God. This is the day thereof I have spoken. And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows and the hand staves and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years. So that they shall take no wood out of the field, neither cut down any of the forest, for they shall burn the weapons with fire, and they shall spoil those that spoil them, and rob those that rob them, saith the Lord God. Can you imagine a fire burning for seven years without any wood? I've heard a few interpretations, but I don't know. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog a place there of graves. Oh yeah, Gog's going to have a place for graves. Uh, a place there of graves in Israel, the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea. And it shall stop the noses of the passengers. And there shall they bury Gog in all his multitude. And they shall call it the valley of Haman Gog. Oh yeah. And seven months shall the house of Israel be bearing them, that they may cleanse the land. Do you know there's going to be so many dead, it's going to take seven months to bury them all? Woo-wee! I hope I got some uh, uh, clothespins to uh, hold my nose. Well, I don't know. I'll be one of them, but maybe, maybe not. Yea, all the people of the land shall bury them, and it shall be to them a renown the day that I shall be glorified, saith the Lord God. And they shall sever 
out men of continual employment passing through the land to bury with the passengers those that remain upon the face of the earth to cleanse it. After the end of seven months shall they search. And the passengers that pass through the land, when any seeth a man's bone, then shall he set up a sign by it till the barriers have buried it in the valley of Hamangog. And also the name of the city shall be Hamanah, Thus shall they cleanse the land. Mm. And thou, son of man, thus saith the Lord God, Speak unto every feathered fowl, that's a bird, and to every beast of the field, Assemble yourselves and come, gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice, that I do sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel, that ye may eat flesh and drink blood. What are vultures? And uh, vultures, what else do they call them? Um, they eat the dead, right? Vultures. That's what they do. Is there another thing that happens uh, in Israel? Now, personally, I think this ties in to Revelation chapter 19. Let's start verse 11. I mean, I'm already into this an hour, and I'm you know, I'm probably about two-thirds done. Uh, Revelation 19.11 And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Now, remember in a previous study I just did um, about the, uh, the, the one on the white horse with the bow? I think it was Revelation one or two or three chapters one two or three i forget which uh, and all the bible commentaries will tell you that's the antichrist and i don't think so because it tells you right here the rider on the white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war his eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. If you don't know who the Word of God is, I'll give you a little secret. Uh, let you know a little secret. It's Jesus who is the Christ. 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean what does that do to black hebrews uh, never mind and out of, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty god and he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written king of kings and lord of lords Sorry, that's not the Antichrist. 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all that, uh, saying to all, the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven. So he's saying, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls, the birds, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Fowls were filled with their flesh. Hmm. Okay. Let's go back to 
Ah, uh, da Let's go to uh, Ezekiel 39, 17. And thou, son of man, thus saith the Lord God, speak unto every feathered fowl and to every beast of the field, assemble yourselves and come gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice that I do sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel that ye may eat flesh and drink blood. And ye shall eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth of rams, of lambs, and of goats, of bullocks, all of them fatlings of Bashan. And ye shall eat fat till ye be full, and drink blood till ye be drunken of my sacrifice, which I have sacrificed for you. Thus ye shall be filled at my table with horses and chariots, with mighty men and all men of war, saith the Lord God. Sounds like the same language to me. And I will set my glory among the heathen, and all the heathen shall see my judgment that I have executed, and my hand that I have laid upon them. So the house of Israel, the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day and forward. And the heathen shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity. Why did the house of Israel go into captivity, you know, slavery? Because of their evilness, their wickedness, their sin. Because they trespassed against me, therefore hid I my face from them and gave them into the hand of their enemies. God gave them into the hand of their enemies. So fell they all by the sword, according to their uncleanness and according to their transgressions have I done unto them and hid my face from them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Now I will bring again the captivity of Jacob and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel and will be jealous for my holy name. After that, they have borne their shame and all their trespasses whereby they have trespassed against me when they dwell, dwelt safely in their land and none made them afraid. When I have brought them again from the people and gathered them out of their enemies' lands and am sanctified in them in the sight of many nations, then shall they know that I am the Lord their God, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen. But I have gathered them unto their own land and have left none of them any more there. Neither will I hide my face any more from them for I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord God. What is all this pouring out the spirit? Uh, let's take a look at a couple things. Proverbs 123, turn you at my reproof. What does reproof means? Uh, it's basically correction. When the Lord reproves you or gives you reproof, it means he gives you a spanking. So he wants you to turn. You're going in the wrong direction. Turn. Turn around. Go the right way. You know, I hope you get the idea. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit, pour out my spirit unto you, and I will make known my words unto you. Isaiah 44, 3. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. Uh, let's see, Joel 2.28 and 2.29. And it shall come to pass afterwards, afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams. Oh, that's why I've been having dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon your, uh, the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. Acts 2.17 And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Oh yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, let's see. In Acts 2.18, 2, And all my servants and all my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. All right, so let's take a look. Um, all right, now, something you should know. Uh, go to Revelation chapter 20. Now, the, the thing is, uh, when the Lord returns at the end of the tribulation period, no, the church is not going anywhere prior to the tribulation period, contrary to what modern teachings are. Nobody 200, 300 years ago thought the church wouldn't be here for the tribulation. The tribulation is for the church. You know, but uh, the church will be here until the end. Christ will return at the end of the tribulation at the last trump, which is the seventh trump in Revelation. But that's another study. And if anybody's confused about it, I'll be happy to send you a thing uh, proving it's true from the Bible alone, not my opinion. But then there's going to be a thousand years of peace. They call it the Millennial Kingdom Reign. Uh, milli, M-I-L-L, -L, like millimeter, means thousand. It's just a Latin word that means thousand. And there's a lot of Latin words in English, people, a lot. So, yeah, people say, well, you know, Latin words don't belong in English. Well, then quit saying taco. And don't say tequila either. You know, what can I tell you? That's not an English word. But um, at the end of a thousand years of peace, there's going to be a time when Satan's released from his temporary prison to test people. And I did a Bible study on this. Who are the people in the millennial kingdom with children. Jesus said that uh, in the kingdom we wouldn't marry nor be given in married marriage. So if that's true, where do where do children come from? Where? Well, what happens to all the children that were aborted? Children that died in childbirth? You know, aren't they going to be given a chance to grow up? And to be tested? I think so. So that's what, at the end of the thousand year reign of Christ, all these people, I believe, are going to be grown up, have a chance to live a thousand years without being tempted to Satan. And that's where we're at right now. So Revelation 20, verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. Now, I've had people tell me the devil and Satan are two different beings. No, Revelation 22 tells you. So the dragon, the false prophet and the beast, the dragon is the old serpent, the devil and Satan. Tells you right there. And the old serpent, well, when you read Genesis chapter 3 and you got a serpent talking to Eve, what do you think they're talking about? A talking snake? I don't think so. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent. Why old? He's been around for a long time. Since the Garden of Eden which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So an angel comes down from heaven, having a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he grabs hold of the dragon, and he binds him, he locks him up for a thousand years. Verse 3, And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon it, that he should deceive the nations no more. Satan's not going to deceive the nations no more till a thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. So the devil's going to be locked up for a thousand years, and then he's going to be given, oh, sort of kind of parole, I guess, for a little while, right? 
Verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. This is the introduction, people. See, the pre-tribbers want you to think that the church is up in heaven having a party and everybody on the earth is getting their heads cut off and being beheaded for, you know, not worshiping the beast. Uh, and then what happens to these people? You know, no, that's not how it works. Verse 5. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath the first uh, that hath part in the first resurrection. Now, how can you have a first resurrection? at the beginning of the tribulation, and then people are dying during the tribulation. Uh, how does that work? Wouldn't there be more than one? Well, yeah, there is. There's two. There's the first resurrection, which is of the righteous, and then there's the second, which is of the wicked. That's why Jesus Christ comes once at the end of the tribulation when the last person has died for their faith or in the faith, and Christ comes back, they all get resurrected. First resurrection. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. What do you mean the second death? Oh, well, there's a physical death, and then there is a spiritual death. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. I guess that's going to be a one heck of a jailbreak, huh? Well... They're going to give him the keys. And he shall go out to deceive the nations, which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about. And the beloved city, what's the beloved city? Jerusalem. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Boy, that's going to be a short battle, huh? Verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. Remember, that's the unholy trinity. The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I've had people ask me, Bob, is um, are people cast into the lake of fire and do they suffer in hell forever and ever and ever? I've heard people say, yeah, hell is forever. And then I've heard others say, no, they're destroyed. You know, when death and hell is cast into the lake of fire, it's done. But I'll tell you what, the only three that I'm 100% sure of that are tormented forever and ever is in verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. So the devil, the beast, and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So these three entities are not going to, they're not going to need a sweater where, where they're going because it's not going to be cold anytime soon. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. 
Now there's the judgment seat of Christ, and then there's the great white throne. You want to be at the judgment seat of Christ, where you're shown grace and mercy. The great white throne is bad news bears. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. Wow. I always have a lot of people say, oh, Lordship salvation, we're, we're not judged by our works. You know, our works has nothing to do with salvation. Well, yeah, believing in Christ, mercy and uh, grace comes from Christ alone, but we're going to be judged according to our works. You know, what is your place in heaven going to be? Are you going to be a janitor? Or are you going to be a ruler over 10 cities? And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. So you got the book of life, but there's more than one book. Are there two books of life, or is it a book of life and a book of death? I, you know, makes you wonder. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell, death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. You know, during World War II, a lot of people were buried at sea, uh, especially in the Pacific. A lot of people, a lot of, a lot of people in the United States died in the Pacific Ocean. Matter of fact, there was a uh, there's an area, I think it's the Solomon Islands. Um, oh gosh, well, Guadalcanal. They called it Iron Bottom Sound because there were so many ships that sank, American and Japanese, that they called it Iron Bottom Sound. A lot of sailors died there. From what I understand, China's been um, going to that area and raising these ships up for the steel. That's what I've heard. I don't know how true it is, but I've read that. So, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. So hell is delivering up the dead. Uh, this ain't the people in the book of life, people. This ain't them. Uh-uh-uh. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. First death is physical. Second death is spiritual. Soul and spirit. In Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said, And fear not them which kill the body. Yeah, don't fear the children of the devil that can kill your body. Don't fear them. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. See, they can't kill your soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And who is that? The Lord. God the Father, Christ. So we're not to fear those that can kill, you know, the body only. No. Let's read Revelation 6 real quick, verse 7. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death. And hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar, 
And this is the altar of God now. I saw under the altar the souls, the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried. Who cried? The souls under the altar. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? How long, O Lord? And the Lord, or one of the angels, or somebody says, Well, you know, you got to wait until your fellow servants have also been slain. That's the Bob paraphrase, but yeah. So... Revelation 20, 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in them, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I don't think I want to go there. So I hope. Oh, uh, one more thing I got to uh, forgot to mention. There is an article in um, the Encyclopedia Britannica. If you look at Ashkenazi, that's spelled A-S-H-K-E-N-A-Z-I. Look at the four last four letters of that word. Um, they say plural is Ashkenazim, and they say from Hebrew it's Ashkenaz. I remember Ashkenaz was uh, of Japheth, right? Yeah, Ashkenaz, Japheth. Not even Shem, not even the chosen ones. But they'll tell you that Ashkenaz is Germany. And then the, and I quote from Britannica Online Encyclopedia, uh, members, member of the Jews who lived in the Rhineland Valley, Rhineland is a, a section of Germany, and in neighboring France before their migration eastward to Slavic lands, Slavic lands, e.g. Poland, Lithuania, Russia, uh, that also includes Ukraine. After the Crusades, 11th through the 13th century and their descendants. After the 17th century, persecutions in Eastern Europe, large number of these Jews resettled in Western Europe where they assimilated <coughs> as they had done in Eastern Europe with other Jewish communities. In time, all the Jews who had adopted the German Rite synagogue ritual were referred to as Ashkenazim to distinguish them from the Shepardic, which was the uh, northern uh, Africa Jews that went to Spain, okay, uh, to distinguish them from the Shepardic Spanish Rite Jews. Ashkenazim differ from Shepardim in their pronunciation of Hebrew, well, yeah, the Ashkenazi speak Yiddish, in cultural traditions and synagogues uh, chanting, in their widespread use of Yiddish, and especially in synagogue liturgy. Today, Ashkenazim constitute more than 80% of all the Jews in the world, vastly outnumbering Shepardic Jews. Um, in the early 21st century, Ashkenazic Jews numbered about 11 million, in Israel, the numbers of Ashkenazim and Shepardim are roughly equal, and the chief rabbinate has both an Ashkenazic and a Shepardic chief rabbi on equal footing. All Reform and conservative Jewish, uh, Jewish congregations belong to the Ashkenazic tradition. Now, it's funny. The Bible scholars will tell you that Ashkenaz, Gog and Magog, is Russia. Germany, Russia, and that area. Isn't it funny how what we just read is from that same area? Coincidence? Eh, could be. Possibly. So, alrighty, well, just remember, 
Um, I got to fix my Telegram channel. I got some crazy people on my Telegram channel. But please understand, I got three email sites, three emails that I get people from, emails from people. I get, uh, I'm on a number of different sites like Gab. I'm on a different number of sites like Odyssey and, you know, obviously Tube, Telegram, uh, World Truth. Uh, I'm all over the place. And that doesn't even include when I'm looking at news. And so all of you that send me news, um, thank you very much. Sometimes I've seen it. Sometimes I haven't. Sometimes two or three people send me the same story, but that's all right. Because, um, you know, better to see something a couple times. It only takes a few minutes. But uh, sometimes I don't even have time to go through the news anymore. Because I'm so busy with other things. But, you know. So, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, amen.